Howdy. Oh. <laughs> hey, everybody. Welcome to the Chisholm Trail Heritage Center. We are so glad you decided to join us today. We have a great trail talk in store for you. I'm Edie, and I was not around last week, and so I'm really glad to be back. Trail talk is one of my favorite things, but enough about me. I want to introduce you to our special guest today. This is Nathan Mackey, and Nathan has um, a thing with snakes. I, I'm gonna, it's a good thing for him. I'm not going to say I'm on board with all that yet, but maybe he'll convince me by, by the time this is over. Anyway, he's, he has a great Facebook page called Snakes on the Plains. Um, don't go look at it right now. You'll have a chance to look at it later, but he's going to share a lot of information with us today about snakes and some beautiful photography. Yes, I use the word beautiful describing snakes. Beautiful <laughs> photography. So, um, Nathan, I'll start off. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into all this snake business? Well, um, growing up, I was always fascinated with uh, with reptiles, you know, in general, all, and all kinds of animals. Um, I was always spending times in the creeks and stuff like that, you know, finding snakes or, or doing different things, me and the neighborhood kids. Well, um, fast forward to my adult life, me and my son was actually on a hike in the Wichita mountains and uh, stumbled upon a western diamondback rattlesnake and uh, piqued both of our fascination. So we decided that, uh, you know, it was kind of neat and that night I got to talking to him and I'd never seen a copperhead. So we thought, let's go out and drive and see if we can find a copperhead and lo and behold, we found the copperhead. And I happened to have my camera with me, so I thought, why not? I'll try to take some pictures of this copperhead. So I did, and one thing led to another, and it kind of turned into this. So uh, twofold, I just enjoy taking pictures. I enjoy the, the animals, and, and also I enjoy this side of it, the education, because they're so misunderstood. There's so many uh, myths out there and, and just outright uh, false uh, information that's put out. And they're very misunderstood. I like to try to educate people and, and, and kind of all get on the on the same sheet of music. Right. Okay. So, um, so what you have today is kind of a PowerPoint yes. that's going to teach us or dispel some of those myths. Yes. And give us correct information. Yes. About snakes yeah. and all while we get to enjoy some of your great photography. Yeah. Yeah. This is a, this is a great show, guys. <laughs> Y'all are in for something wonderful. Yeah. So, um, how about if we just go ahead and get started okay. with this 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 snake is uh makes me think of a like a dragon i don't know about you guys but yeah. i think he looks it like does, a dragon it does look like one and i'll start by saying i'm by no means an expert uh what i've learned is pretty much some reading and i'm surrounding myself with very knowledgeable people who have actually taught me a lot so i like to try to reciprocate that uh, back out but uh we will get into what this is later more in depth but this is an eastern coach whip those are uh those are throughout about Duncan area and east and then they transition to the western species which we'll get over that also in due time. Like I said uh, my Facebook and at the end of this I'll have a not a link but a the wording for my Facebook. I have Instagram and also a YouTube page that I just started that you can follow along on some of my hunts when I go out and, and look for these with me and my son and, and different people. So we did the snakes on the plains and uh, it's mainly this is going to cover southwest Texas but north Texas or southwest Oklahoma but also north Texas it's pretty much one and the same when it comes to comes to this. Uh, so today's learning points, uh, a lot of people do get confused on venomous uh, versus poisonous. Uh, you know, people think of a rattlesnake as being poisonous when actually it's not, it's, it's venomous. It's just wording, but I'll explain the difference in that. Uh, some of the benefits of venomous and non-venomous snakes, because they are there for a reason, uh, they do have roles in the ecosystem, and they are beneficial. Uh, local snake identification, obviously I can't go over every snake, there's a lot of snakes in here, but the ones that are most common and the ones that you might encounter while you're working in the garden uh, on the walk or something like that, and maybe you can, you'll know what you're looking at so that you maybe alleviate that fear. Uh, snake myths, uh, and there's, I could make a five hour show out of snake myths, uh, but I'll cover just a few of them, and if anybody has questions, I think we can uh, facilitate that, and I'll try to answer the best I can, and if I don't have the answer, I'll get back to you. Uh, snake safety, uh, it's pretty much common sense on that. We'll go over a few things on that. And some online resources too, that if you have something uh, pop up, such as a snake or, or that you're not uh, sure of, uh, you can take a picture, send it to this, and they will get back with you within a few minutes as to what it is and what you need to do, and different things like that. Nice. Um, poisonous, like I said, people always 
define, you know, venomous snakes as poisonous. Uh, poisonous defined uh, is a substance causing or capable of causing death or illness if it's taken into the body. That's going to be your home cleaning products, uh, medications, pesticides, and things like this. Uh, so this is something that you ingest into your mouth that is poisonous. So a now there are poisonous snakes, uh, not necessarily around here so much, but there are like killbacks and things that are over in different countries and things that are actually, they eat poisonous toads and they take in that toxin and if something is to eat that snake, it will die. So that therefore it is a poisonous snake. So there are poisonous snakes, but around here they are venomous snakes. So that's just a common uh, mis, miswording there. Uh, things like your uh, pesticides, fingernail polish, remover, anything that you're gonna ingest that is gonna cause you problems, that is going to be poison. So, venomous. Uh, venomous defined as of animals, especially snakes, uh, or their parts, secreting venom, capable of injecting venom by the means of a bite or a sting. So that is where a venomous snake obviously has fangs and it will inject venom into you. So that's where that comes from. Uh, Oklahoma has seven venomous species of snakes. Uh, copperheads are broke into two subspecies. You could have, say, eight, but we're going to stick with seven. Just keep it together and keep it simple. Uh, but also you have uh, some spiders like a black widow or brown recluse or they call them a fiddleback. Those are actually a venomous spider. Uh, scorpions, wasp, etc. Anything that can bite you, sting you, inflict pain, that is a venomous creature. Uh, start on snake benefits. This is just kind of a breakdown. This is a, something I just pulled off the web, obviously, but it's all part of the overall ecosystem. And yeah. look how falsely friendly that snake looks. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just pointing that out. <laughs> so you got, you know, uh, grass, you know, a mouse gets eaten by the snake or eats, or the, you know, the rabbit is eaten by the snake and then turned eaten by the hawk. It's all part of the food chain and overall ecosystem. And uh, we'll get into a little bit why it's important to keep everything that is put in the ecosystem in the ecosystem so it doesn't throw everything off and then bad things happen. I don't, people have a great fear of snakes and they want to kill everyone they see, but they're there for a reason. And that's why I try to educate people just to kind of make that, that difference there. Uh, Non-venomous snake benefits, kind of go over a little bit of, of that. Um, examples, and this was one that I pulled up a few years ago when I was looking, it may still be on the internet. Um, it was a Florida dog kennel owner who was not very fond of snakes. So uh, he had numerous non-venomous rat snakes. They were all in the rafters. They were all over his uh, dog kennel, you know, because of dog food and things like that. So he gets the, uh, idea that he's going to kill these snakes because he doesn't like them so he kills them after he kills all the snakes rats take the place over they do thousands of dollars in structural damages eat, they ruin 100 pounds of dog food take about two years and hundreds of hours of manpower to regain control the reason he's seeing all these snakes is because snakes they don't just want to come in your head your home because they smell lasagna that you're cooking you know they're going to eat your lasagna that's not what it is when they come in someplace that they're going after their natural food source which is usually mice Mice like to go in your homes because they do smell the food. So when they fall to go into your house, they're small, they're smelling that rat and they're following up on that, trying to find a mouse, a rat, a lizard, anything else like that that's in their food chain. Uh, they don't want to be in there with you. They don't really, they're not the most intellectual animals. They don't realize what they're doing, but they go in there and, that, and that's why they would show up in there. And that's why they were here, obviously, uh, because they've got dog food and things like that. So it's attracting rats. So in turn, rat snakes are coming to eat the rats. So that's probably was a good idea for him to keep those there. He didn't realize it. Uh, farmers, uh, you know, if you have them around the grain silos, that's, that's a great way to prevent spoilage, uh, you know, keep them there so they keep the rodent population in check. You're going to see an increased amount of snakes. I assume farmers can probably tell you around their silos. Uh, larger non-venomous snakes eat mice and rats, obviously it helps control uh, certain diseases. And a lot of non-venomous snakes eat other snakes, which include venomous snakes. So a lot of people won't mind having a king snake or a coach whip, which is what was in that first picture. Because uh, in other snakes, uh, other kinds of king snakes will actually eat other snakes and uh, venomous snakes too. So they are not completely immune to the venom, but it doesn't affect them like it would another animal if they're bitten by it. Right, so quick question, and I bet you're gonna get to this. Is there an easy way to tell venomous from non-venomous we, it, there's no clear cut 100% way, just more or less you get to educate yourself. But I will go over some, some tips and things to look for mm -hmm. that are indicative of a venomous snake so that you will know that, okay, this is probably venomous. I need to, you know, leave it alone, uh -huh. call somebody like that comes in and then I, I do that too. I'll come in and 
Uh, this snake here, as a matter of fact, I relocated that from a lady that was up by Comanche Lake Road, uh, a cottonmouth. So uh, okay. I'll go over some some different things like that. So as far he's as, talking about, uh, of course, this is just the head. Look at that amazing photograph, yeah. though, of that. That's a cottonmouth. A cottonmouth. County. Yes. Okay. Water moccasin, same thing. Cottonmouth water moccasin. Those are interchangeable terms. They're they're the okay. same thing. Okay. Um, not friendly. <laughs> They don't, they're not near as bad as what people make them out to be. Okay. Yeah, All right. They can be All right. Grumpy. Carry on. This All is right. intriguing. Uh, venomous snake benefits. Uh, venomous snakes also play a vital part in the overall ecosystem. Uh, all venomous snakes eat rats and mice. Uh, most also eat lizards, ground dwelling birds, and, and different things like that. Uh, taking venomous snakes out of the ecosystem would have devastating effects. Uh, University of Maryland study. Uh, found that rattlesnakes help lower the chances of humans contacting Lyme disease. Huh. Lyme disease obviously is a bacterial illness that's uh, caused seri serious neurological problems in humans. It's spread by ticks, uh, which feed on infected mice and other small mammals, and then pass it on to humans. Rattlesnakes and other predators help keep these rodent populations in check. Uh, the decline in these predators may have a factor in Lyme disease's prevalence, especially up in the Northeast and North Central United States. Lyme disease has been exploding over the last 10, 12 years. I, why that is, I, I don't really know. Uh, but the University of Maryland study showed that each rattlesnake, and this was specifically to timber rattlesnakes, uh, removed approximately, and I've verified this again yesterday, make sure it's correct, 2,500 to 4,500 ticks annually. That wow. is what one timber rattlesnake in the right situation can take out of the ecosystem. So that just goes to overall how everything stays in check and it's there for a reason, whether you like looking at them or not, they're there for a reason. So by consuming these rodents they're just consuming whatever ticks are on those rodents yes. yeah okay and i and that overall that may be you know that ticks offspring they're taking into account i don't know exactly how that works but they are uh -huh. taking that many ticks off of you know the chance of it landing on another person and, and spreading right. that disease right because yes. i don't like snakes but i don't like ticks either no, so not a, not a you know this is this is yeah. good news this yeah, is good news fan. this the snake is uh you know yeah. inching its way into uh my uh field of Tolerable. acceptance yeah, yeah right now so far <laughs> all right and also uh this is something not many people know but snake venom has uh, uses in the medical field uh pygmy rattlesnake which is found around here they actually use uh, a peptide of that venom uh, for certain medications uh, in heart patients which helps uh, i believe it helps uh, thin the blood and things like that and they can give to heart patients that will actually help them. And there's a lot, there's uh, vipers in other parts of the world that's used for, they're researching for cancer treatments and different things like that. They're just kind of starting to scratch the, the surface of that, but they're thinking that that could be a, a big advancement in the medical field uh, using snake venom and parts of the proteins, peptides, things like that. Of, and I don't understand the in-depth part of it, but using that in order to help uh, treat certain medical problems. So wow. that's something else to think about. Uh, local snake identification. Uh, Oklahoma has approximately 37 common species of non-venomous snakes. Now, that's not a definitive number, so I put approximately. That's uh, what's recognized on the website that I kind of follow. There's more depending on who you ask or, or less. Uh, those, more than about half are commonly found in southwest Oklahoma and North Texas. And I say commonly, those are the ones that you would be more common to stumble upon. Um, we'll cover the most commonly misidentified non-venomous species. Uh, you know, can't go over all of them, obviously, but we'll, we'll hit, the hit the top of it. My wife actually sent me this last night and thought it would be kind of funny to put in there. And it's true. It said Texas, but I switched it to anyone. Now anyone can identify a snake. It's a helpful guide. It's a king snake. I don't know what it is, but it's really big. And a garter snake, I don't know, but it's small. Rat snake, it's brown. Copperhead, it's scary. And a garden snake, it's actually a garter snake. People call them garden snakes. Oh, but yeah. they know what a rattlesnake is. Everybody knows a rattlesnake because it's got a pretty right. defining characteristic that's, that's attached good. to its tail. That's a good one. But well, honestly, this could also be kind of... Uh, you know, modified a little bit that anything that is brown, people think is a copperhead automatically, uh -huh. uh, or anything that's in the water. I see this all the time. People say, I've seen a water moccasin or cotton mouse. No, you didn't. Yes, I did, because they know they know what they're talking about, but they really, they're not, they think they do, but they really don't. Mm -hmm. um, so they run into that a lot. And an example of that is, uh, I'll use my own mother's example. She was helping a lady. A uh, couple move a couple years ago and called me and said they found a copperhead in a box and I told her no she didn't she said well yes I did because the husband said it was a copperhead and I said no it's not because it's not the right area or time and stuff like that and sent me a picture of it it was a rat snake but they chopped it up into about 10 pieces because I thought it was a 
cottonmouth. It was, <laughs> like I said, it was in a box in their house looking for their food source. Right, so. right. But anyways. A we'll snake get in the house might end up in tiny pieces <laughs> if it was at my house too. Yeah, well, that's, uh, I, I'll come, uh, you know, and I'll give you some information afterwards. I'm uh, not always free, but if I'm free, uh, I will for free come yeah. gladly re relocate whatever from your house or property that, that you might have a problem with. One of the common ones is a bull snake. Um, and these are pictures that I've taken. This is actually a small baby that was uh, probably not even a year old yet that I found on the road a few uh, last year. And this one, you can't tell, that, that dude there's about six foot long and I found him out in uh, Beckham County, Oklahoma, in Western Oklahoma, right outside of a, uh, a uh, little gopher mound where he, he's been you know, having a smorgasbord. He, he was very big. And uh, these guys are commonly misidentified as rattlesnakes. And I'll see if I can get, uh, I'll get to that in a little bit. I got a video that I'll try to pull up and show you that shows how they mimic. That's not really mimicry, but they sound like a, a rattlesnake and it fools a lot of people into thinking they are. Uh, but they're yellow and tan colored body. Uh, dark blotches run down the center of its back. Uh, they're peppered with small blotches on the sides. Belly's uh, yellow with dark spots. It's an excellent predator. It's one of the best uh, rodent predators out there, venomous or non-venomous. They are, they're very good at that. Adults are from four to six foot in length. Uh, they're frequently mistaken for a rattlesnake. They're large size and they're quote unquote aggressive, which is actually misinterpreted. It's defensive, but they, people take it as aggressiveness. Uh, and they'll rattle their tail, and a lot of snakes will too. And that's not necessarily mimicry of a rattlesnake. People think it is. That's just a common snake. They, they rattle their tails and rattlesnakes just happen to adapt to a rattle on the end of it over over years so that's so not necessarily how does the mimicry. snake's tail rattle if there's no rattle well it's not really a rattle they just like they, they'll uh, do they, this and if they're in the leaves like. yeah if they're oh. in the leaves especially like a, a copperhead will do that when they're in the leaves and they'll rattle their tail and it will it'll buzz and it sounds like kind of like a uh -huh. rattlesnake and that's just to get your attention it's a way to we're making no making you see them so that hopefully you go away right you know and i'll see if i can get this video to play and you'll have to um You'll have to excuse the, it will be sideways because I could not get it turned back, but if you can hear it, uh, you'll be able to hear what I'm, what I'm talking about. And my computer is a little bit slow, obviously. If you can hear that, that's him sucking in air and pushing out air. But you can hear it, it does sound like a rattle. Uh -huh. And people misinterpret that and think that it is a rattlesnake because it's rattling its tail. And then also you can, you can hear that. Well, and if you walk up on a four, five, six foot long snake, I mean, even if smaller, um, and it's colored like that, yeah. and it takes you you, you, you're not expecting that, and then it makes that sound. Yes. You. That's you, what people think mm -hmm, it is. A right. Snake, yeah. It's going to be a reaction that people would have. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. They, they have a in in their mouth where they take air in. They have a modification that they can they flap that back and forth, and they're sucking in air and pushing it out. That makes that noise. Most snakes don't have that. Some of them will kind of hiss a little bit, but that that's the main one that does that around here. So the bull snake is the yeah. that one. Bull snake. So if and they knew that that was making them sound like a rattlesnake and increasing their chances of being chopped into pieces, uh, do you think that that would change? I don't know. Their I, mind I think about <laughs> their thought is is that there's a big predator, even if you mean no harm to it, that's wanting to kill it. They're, so they're going to make the scariest. They're, making, they're trying to be sound. big and scary, while so they puff up too. Uh -huh, you know, all yeah. snakes will do that. They puff up, try to look big. It's posturing mm -hmm. to make you want to go the other way. Well, so a for effort for yeah. that bull snake because yeah. <laughs> that was, that was yeah. convincing. They, they, they did that. And that was one that I, that wasn't the same snake I have a picture of, but that was also out in Beckham County a few years ago on a cold spring day after I stumbled across him hiking. <clears throat> uh, rat snakes is another one. This is probably the most common one you'll see around here. Uh, Southwest Oklahoma, North Texas have two species of rat snakes, a Western rat snake and a Great Plains rat snake. And that, that's actually my son. He is, that's a Great Plains rat snake. He is getting it in position so I can take a picture of it that we found in Comanche County last year. He's my snake hunting partner. Uh, this is a Western rat snake. Um, I took this picture in uh, Eastern Stevens County this spring. And you can tell why people might think that they are a venomous rattlesnake. They mm -hmm. look pretty mean and it's all a big bluff show. Uh, they will, pull up like this, they open their mouth and they'll show the whites of their mouth, get your attention. 
and it's all once again posturing. So that hopefully you see this and you want to leave it alone. And mm -hmm. this guy, Help you know, <laughs> he did bite me about three times while I was taking the pictures, but it doesn't hurt. Uh, Non-venomous snake bite is not bad at all. I mean, usually it's not even gonna break the skin. It just feels like you're getting hit. So, so what, what is, what are they biting you with? They have, you can't really see it, but there are small, right through here, there's really, really small teeth that okay. they use kinda to. Kind of like a catfish kind of teeth thing uh, or something? A little bit longer, then there's less of them, whereas a catfish okay. is more, you know, there's so many of them you can feel. These these will, they can break the skin. Like this one actually did break the skin a little bit because he's big. This rat snake was about five, five and a half foot long, so it's pretty big. So it, it did break the skin a little bit, but they're just little bitty tiny teeth that barely break the skin. It's mm -hmm. no big deal. I go and put some hand sanitizer on it and, and go on and it's, mm -hmm. you wash your hands. And, and it's I fine. mean, obviously if he had, if he was venomous, mm -hmm. right, um, there would be fangs that you could see. Uh, well, usually snakes, uh, the snakes around here that are venomous, they're fangs are hinged so when they open their mouth like i have a picture or this picture of this well he's not gaping his mouth but i have a picture of a cotton a few cotton mouths that have their mouths open you can see the sheaths that their fangs stay inside but they're folded back so when they go to bite they lunge out then those teeth will come out in order ah, okay. to hit what they're but if they just open their mouth they're not you don't see just the fangs per se protruding like what uh -huh. you would expect okay yeah. so a, a venomous snake could open their mouth and it would look yes like it would that. look similar to that and you would see right up here the sheathing and i think i have a picture in here of that cotton mouth and i can point that out later okay that is in but it's not real easy to see right so they, right. they pretty much will look like that for the most part okay the venomous ones but that's why people the rat snakes and they're very their variation in color in this area is very great. You'll have some like this that's yellowish red, and you'll have some that are completely black. So they vary a lot. They're kind of harder to identify for that reason. Uh, this is another one. This one was over six foot long. It's a little bit darker. You can't tell, but I found this guy last spring in May. Uh, he was under some uh, boards, but he, he was very big. But this guy, six foot long, never showed any defensive behavior, let me hold him, and me and my son held him. And, he was perfectly fine with it, so. So when you find these snakes, are you out looking in, for it, you're out looking for snakes? Most of the time, yes. Um, so you're lifting up boards, and so what kind yeah. of, where, where are these snakes hiding? This is my question. Well, where, it's, what kind of places are they hanging out? It depends out? what time of the year it is. Okay. Uh, in springtime, starting in, depending on how it warms up, in March, uh, mid late March April when it starts getting warm uh, snakes will emerge from brumation that's not they don't hibernate truly hibernation is go in you sleep for months brumation mm -hmm. uh, with snakes they go in but if it's a warm winter day they may come outside their den like a rattlesnake and they'll hit the sun they thermoregulate you know they're they're they don't make their own body temperature body heat so they go out and they use the sun to regulate their body temperature so they're not a true hibernation they're kind of more and out so when these snakes start to come out from that, that brumation, they will start to go underneath things to collect sun, warmth, and they can also hunt under there. Like this one was underneath uh, a big board with uh, rat tunnels under it. So he was sitting there in ambush waiting for a rat to come along. Uh. So in the springtime, to answer your question, in the springtime, uh, under rocks uh, and any kind of debris, uh, boards, uh, a lot of guys that do what I do, and they believe it or not, there's a lot of guys that, people that go out and do this, believe it or not, I never thought it either until I got into it. I thought I was the only weirdo. But uh, there's people that go and find old barns that have been hit by storms. It has tin thrown everywhere and stuff like that. And uh, under any kind of cover. But once it warms up into the heat, most snakes will go out and uh, it's just, it's too hot under things. So they will go out and they will thermoregulate by being in the shade or the sun different times of the day. Um, most of your, not all, most of your non-venomous snakes are active during the day and most of your venomous pit vipers are active during the night. So uh, in the spring, I primarily flip stuff. And in the summer, like right now, uh, if you want to find them, uh, I have certain areas that I'll go drive for different species of snake and you can find them that way, just driving through the roads. They'll be crossing the roads because they're out looking for food. Just going from point A to point B. Okay. So, um, Western rat snakes, the characteristics, um, they're very long, dark colored, uh, can vary greatly in, in uh, color, as I, as I said. They can be totally black, have dark blotches, uh, some reddish orange flecks will be mixed in. Uh, their bellies are white to greenish yellow and they can grow six foot long. And they will also rattle their tail 
uh, when they're threatening. So they don't have a rattle, but they'll, they'll flip it back and forth. And that's just a visual cue that you might see it. And most people are going to go the other way or something that might eat it. They're just trying to d deter it, you know. Uh, Great Plains rat snake. I don't have any great pictures of Great Plains rat snakes. I looked through, and uh, but this is one I took this spring. They look uh, kind of similar, but they're uh, they're a little bit different. Um, that's another one there, but they look they look kind of similar mm -hmm. uh, to the Western rat snake. It's uh, tan to brown body with dark blotches on its back and side. Uh, belly's checkered, has stripes under its tail. It's much smaller than the Western rat snake. That's the big difference. Uh, they'll reach about three foot. If you get about three foot maybe three and a half, that's about as big as you're going to find a Great Plains rat snake. They're just smaller subspecies like a western rat snake will get much larger, almost twice that, that size. Um, water snakes, these are the by, hands down the most commonly misidentified snakes there are. Uh, people see a snake near the water and they automatically assume it's a venomous cottonmouth or a water moccasin, like so those are interchangeable. Uh, there's a few species of water snake that's native to southwest Oklahoma, North Texas. Uh, the most common one that I see is the plain-bellied water snake, and they call them plain. They're pretty much, as a juvenile, they will have a pattern, but as they uh, grow into adults, they just have pretty much a plain, either greenish or dark black color on their top, and they will have uh, a plain white belly. That's where they get their names. Diamondback water snakes and the Graham's crayfish snake. Graham's crayfish is pretty rare. I've only run across a few of those ever myself, but these other two are very common, and they're constantly misidentified as a, a cottonmouth, and I'll go over some ways to identify those. But this is a plain-bellied water snake. Uh, and as you can see, it still has some of its pattern. This one was about two and a half foot long. And water snakes are pretty grumpy, usually. I'm not real fond of them because they musk you. It's just, mm -hmm. that's they secrete stuff that uh, stinks mm -hmm. really bad. And they're bitey, so I just usually kind of live them, live them do their own thing. But does, does that smell like, does it come off of them and can it get It comes you? out of their cloaca it's a their vent as you call it it's where uh -huh. their sexual organs and also their uh, they defecate from that area uh -huh. so that's it all comes out of there and it's a defense mechanism because uh, if something goes to grab it to eat it and it gets that it's going to spit it out because right. it doesn't it's just it's doesn't want that smell or that taste so it's just another defense mechanism for for you to want to leave it alone and it works for me i don't <laughs> want to touch them <laughs> but as you can see this one still has a little bit of its pattern some they have kind of a almost like a little uh -huh. checkered pattern, blotches. Uh, and I'll get to this also, as you see its head kind of looks triangular. So everybody thinks triangular's head, it's a cotton mouth, it's by the water. So let's chop its head off and mm -hmm. kill it. Mm -hmm. As you can see, looking directly over the top, the reason I took this picture, and this was a cell phone pic, this is not a camera camera pic. Uh, as you can see its eyes directly from over top. And also you'll see these little bitty, I know it's hard to see on the computer, but there are little bars that run from its lower jaw to its upper jaw all along the sides and that's indicative of a water snake. Cottonmouth will not have those. And if you look at a cottonmouth from directly over top, you will not be able to see its eyes because it has a ridge that runs, very defined ridge that runs from its eyebrows, more or less its brows, all the way to the tip of its nose. It's called a canthal ridge and it runs, and by, look, by doing that, you look over the top and all you're going to see is the eye scales. You're not going to see its eyes. Whereas this kind of looks derpy, I guess mm -hmm. you'd say. It's got the uh, the eyes kind of on the top more or mm -hmm. less and that's that's a water snake they'll always have those oh, okay. that's one way to and sometimes i mean I'll the be investigating their heads and the eyes <laughs> copper head or the uh, cotton mouse water mox and these snakes the bodies do look very similar so I, that's the way i definitively id them all the time is by looking at it's their heads head. yeah um this is another picture of a plain bellied water snake and this is where you can see the bars that's why i took this picture you can see these bars that run from the back of its jaw all the way forward from the bottom to the top. If you see those and you can see its eyes from the top, it is a non-venomous water snake. It is not venomous. Uh, so that's one way that's really easy to tell venomous from non-venomous. Uh, diamondback water snake, this exact same thing. The, the other one was a plain belly. This is a, a diamondback water snake, but the heads look almost identical. Mm -hmm. uh, you can see that the diamondback water snakes have red eyes. It's very distinctive that you can see but they also have these bars, as you can plainly see right through here, and uh, that's easily identifiable. Uh, their pattern, if you look over the top of them, will have almost, it looks like a chain link pattern, like a chain link fence that kind of goes like this, and the chain link pattern is what people call them, and it's very, very easy to see. And with this eye, they're one of the more easily identified water snakes, in my opinion, because they keep, for the most part, they keep this pattern. It doesn't uh, fade out so much like the plain-bellied water snakes may do. 
Uh, Graham's crayfish snake. Um, these don't really, these are semi-aquatic also. They primarily eat crayfish or crawdads as we commonly call them. That's their primary diet. These don't really have the, the lines on their jaw per se, but these, these are pretty rare. You don't see them very often, but one thing that is very definitive on them is they're, they have a very, these scales on the bottom, these cream colored scales come up all the way to the, the mid section of their bodies. They're very easily identifiable, as you can see on its head, that goes all the way down its body. The top half is brown, the bottom half is kind of a creamy yellow. Mm -hmm. And it also has the eyes that you can see over the top <clears throat> and the round pupils that you will be able to see and uh, pretty easily identify them. And they don't get that big. They'll be, you know, two, three foot at the, at the two foot probably at the most. Um, I've looked for two, three years for one and I found two in the last few months. So they're just really, really rare. You don't see them very often. They're kind of sporadic is where you see them. You may see them one place, but not another, so. And I put this in here. Um, these are not my pictures, by the way. This is just something that's off the internet. But everybody that sees these by the water would assume that they all are cotton mouse. And this, this is kind of pixelated, it's got it blown up, but it's got the triangular head. This one has the triangular head and so does this one. Mm -hmm. and this one definitely. So everybody's gonna think, I've got a cotton mouth here. Well, if you look, as I was saying, you can see the bars on the sides, but you can also see the, the eyeballs from over the top. So that tells you that that is a non-venomous uh, water snake. And here's the bars I was talking about. Uh, and here also you can see, you can't really tell, but there's the bars and also the eyes at the top. And this one's the same way. Number two and three are cotton mouths. Those are venomous. And as you can see, they have the elliptical pupil. Venomous snakes in Oklahoma will have an elliptical pupil. There's a species of non-venomous snake that does also too. You can't always use that. And also, I'll go into that in a little bit later on, but their eyes are just like humans. They will dilate out in dark conditions. So that's not really a good way to identify a venomous snake because if it's dark, I've got pictures of rattlesnakes. I think I have one in here uh, that, you know, if it's daylight, they're gonna have a little slit elliptical eye. But if it's dark, like when I'm taking pictures, they're blown out gathering more light. So it's not really the best way to identify. Right, and I don't know about the rest of you, <clears throat> but it seems to me like you kind of have to get close to see that people on that you, eyeball. Yeah, yeah, and that's so, not a thing. That's not, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. that seems like a little yeah. too close for comfort. But <laughs> as you can tell, and I can, I've got other pictures you can see more, but the, the, the Canthal Ridge I'm talking about, Canthal Ridge, runs from over the eye to the tip of the nose. Can't really see it on this one, but it's very defined there too. And cotton mouse will commonly, everybody, thinks that they're gonna chase them. Cotton mouse don't chase you. No snake chases you. That's a complete no wives tale, but they will open their mouths. <laughs> they will open their mouths and gape like this and show you the cotton in their mouth. They do that to call them the cotton mouth in order to try to scare you away. And that's what they're what they're doing. Not all of them do that, but that's pretty common defense uh, behavior of them. They will stand their ground and they'll sit and do that and they'll pop it at you like this. And they'll also waggle their tail, rattle, and try to get your attention. But two and three are cotton mouse. The other ones are non-venomous water snakes. So, uh, other non-venomous uh, snakes. That is a non-venomous uh, variable ground snake, and we'll get into those in a little bit. I found that one in uh, Garvin County, under rock. Milk snakes. Now these aren't really, really common in western Oklahoma. They do occur uh, sporadically in the hill, in the hills, like a, you know. Uh, Wichita Mountains, there I'm sure there are some, and in the hills around them and stuff like that, and it's sporadically in different areas throughout Western Oklahoma. They're really common in Eastern Oklahoma. Not really common, they're more common in Eastern Oklahoma. But people see this, and this is actually my pet milk snake. I have a, this snake at home, actually. Mm. But they see this, and he was caught. He's not a store-bought one, but people see this and think it's a coral snake because it's got bright red and all, and all this stuff. Mm. So they think that automatically it's a coral snake despite what people have told you, there are no coral snakes in Oklahoma. There's never been, there's people like me that would love to find one, so I could go down in the little record books and say I found one here. We've looked for years and years and years, there's none here. Uh, they're primarily in Central and South Texas. There are pockets of them up around Possum Kingdom in North Texas, they, they do occur there, but they're not in Oklahoma. Uh, Dallas-Fort Worth area does have some coral snakes, but they just, they're not on this side of the Red River, they're not here. So if you find a snake that has red, uh, red and black, you know, stuff like this. That is going to be a milk snake, or what we call a long nose snake, also in western Oklahoma, that have a similar pattern like this, or a variable ground snake. But if you find a snake that's got red, 
banding on it, and it's not a venomous snake. It's more likely one of those three species. But this is the most common. Everybody thinks it's a, a uh, coral snake, and they, they kill it. And this is a species of king snake. They, they stay pretty small, but they will actually eat other venomous snakes. Uh, they're, they like to stay under rocks primarily. They're pretty secretive, so they'll, they'll eat uh, things underneath rocks, lizards, and things like that. Uh, Yellow-bellied racer, these are very common. Um, these are, they are, they're pretty, they can be kind of put on a show. They like to rattle their tail and uh, people commonly misidentify them as a rattlesnake even though they don't, they're, when they're juveniles they have some of a pattern. By the time they get about one and a half, two years old, they turn pretty much this bluish black kind of color and their bellies are kind of yellow. So we call them yellow-bellied racers or species of racer. We don't have blue racers or black racers around southwest Oklahoma. They would all be yellow-bellied racers. So, but that's a picture of one. They're just pretty, pretty plain looking. Uh, there's not much to them. Uh, eastern hognose. There's two species of ho uh, subspecies of hognose. The western and eastern hognose that are around here. Eastern hognoses are a lot more uh, prevalent. Hognose. They love to bluff. As you can see, they've got a pointed snout. That's the way you can really, really tell what they are. They have this pointed snout, and they like sandy places because they love to dig. They burrow down in the sand and stuff like that. That's why they have that pointed tail. But as you can see, he's puffed out. He mm -hmm. kind of likes to, that's making himself look big. And what they will do when you, I just walked up on this guy and he puffs out, hoods out on, looks like a, kind of looks like a cobra almost. Mm -hmm. He puffs out and he'll hiss at you. Do almost the same thing as the bull snake. They'll make that noise going in and out with the air and puff themselves up, just trying to look big, trying to scare you away. But this is an Eastern hog nose. Uh, the way I can always tell an eastern hognose is obviously they'll pop out, but they have these two very dark blotches on the on the necks right behind their their uh, jaws, and they have this very pointed nose. It's very obvious what it is. People kill these all the time because they assume that they really legitimately think it's a cobra. You know, they'll think I call me. I found a cobra in my backyard. I'm like, no, you found a hognose. It's a cobra because it puffed up like one. They will come up like one even, and they'll look at you. So, but that's just a big bluff. They're just trying to get you to leave them away, leave them alone. And there's some people out here probably know a little bit about these. These are technically mildly venomous. I don't ever say that because people automatically get scared and, and kill them. They're rear fanged and they don't inject venom, but their saliva has a property that helps them immobilize prey. So what they do, they primarily eat frogs. They will grab onto a frog and they'll sit and chew on it. And when they do this, they'll puncture it with their teeth and their saliva gets in there and it will actually paralyze them and it makes it where they can eat the food. So if you was to get bit by, I've been bit by one of these, I think this one actually nicked me a little bit. It's some people will have a little bit of a reaction where it might turn red and swell a little bit, but that's it. They, when they strike at you, they just hit you. They're just trying to scare you away, but they're, they're perfectly harmless to humans. That's they're, they're not going to hurt you at all. Uh, and they love to play dead too. This is one I found over by Toka. And you can see his eyes are open, and he was watching me walk around with his eyes. But they will roll over on their back. They're pretty funny. They'll open their mouth, he'll stick their tongue out, and they'll sit there and play dead to try to get you to leave it alone, thinking that, well, it's dead, so you'll go on. And uh, they're, they're, they're known for that. They're pretty funny. They're, they're kind of like little drama queens. <laughs> uh, Western hognose, this guy uh, looks, has a different look to it. It's more of a, looks more like rattlesnakey, kind of because it's got the, the same colors, but it has the very pointed nose, and it's got the very, he looks like he's kind of agitated, but that's uh, the way their eyes are. And they will also puff out. Uh, I found him in North Texas, actually, but uh, they do the same thing. They'll play dead and, and do all that. Easiest way to identify hog nose, though, is that, that pointed nose. It's very, very uh, defining feature that's easy to see, and it's for burrow, burrowing down in sand and, and soil. So that's, that's where you'll find that. And he's also mildly venomous, if you'd say rear fang, same thing. Won't hurt you if he bites you. It'll do no harm at all. So, Texas night snake. Yeah. As you can see, he has the vertical pupils. So that's why everybody thinks that they're a venomous snake. This is the Oklahoma snake that has vertical pupils that is, that is uh, non-venomous. Only thing that really means is that they're nocturnal. When things have, you know, the the elliptical pupil, they're nocturnal. It's for seeing at night. Uh, this snake primarily stays undercover, under rocks. I actually found him on the Wichita Mountains. He was out between a rock. Usually they stay under. And, uh, but you can see, they will actually flatten out. Their heads can look triangular, and they have this slit in their eyes, so everybody thinks that they're a rattlesnake, a baby rattlesnake, whatever I always calls them. 
and they'll kill them. But they're a night snake and they're completely harmless. They're not, they, I say that, they're actually mildly venomous too with the rear fangs, but they won't hurt you. They, they're, there's not really venomous saliva and it will have no effect on you if it bites you. Medically, they call it mildly venomous. I always get somebody in the chat that wants to correct me, so I'll just call it out. They are mildly venomous. Will not hurt you if they bite you. And I've, I've messed with these things forever. You can't make them bite you. They don't care. They're not gonna bite you. But if it was to, it's not gonna hurt you. Uh, checkered garter snake. These things are very common. Uh, two kinds of garter snakes. They're ones you will find, you know, crawling through the grass and in your garden. People just really don't know what they are, but you can look at them. They're called checkered garter snakes because so they do have a checkered kind of alternating pattern that goes down through there. Uh, they have kind of some bands behind the head, uh, but they're, they're not going to hurt you. Uh, you're, you're good there. This is a common garter snake. Same thing. This was a big one. This guy's about two, two and a half foot long. But uh, once again, uh, non-venomous, not going to hurt you. It's... Uh, you'll be fine, but you'll run across these in your garden, uh, you know, in the grass. They get hit a lot by people that's weed eating and things like that because they're up against your house trying to get warm or something like that. But uh, harmless, I'm gonna hurt you. Prairie king snake looks a lot like a rat snake, but this is a species of king snake. These sometimes will eat other snakes, but they're not as prone to eat other snakes as other king snakes. They like to mainly eat rodents. But as you can tell with the coloration, they do get misidentified as a rattlesnake or a copperhead because it's brown. Everybody thinks it's a copperhead, but it's, it's really not. You can tell, uh, you can't tell from this, but you can see its eyes from over the top. It's got the round pupils. Uh, it's a non-venomous uh, prairie king snake. Uh, coach whip. These are my favorite snakes, probably my favorite snakes because uh, native to Oklahoma. They, uh, they're kind of the kings of the snakes. They eat other snakes. They're extremely fast. Uh, they're just, they're extremely, uh, intelligent, extremely intelligent as far as the snakes go. Uh, they're smart. This is an eastern coach whip. It's kind of a purplish black. Eastern coach whips will be east of here uh, where we're at in Duncan area. It's kind of weird. People say I-35, but at least in this part of the state, it's almost like 81 is the dividing line. You can go here, east, and kind of an integrated range. You'll find some that have a little bit of characteristics of both. Eastern will be dark black to kind of a purple. If you go west, they will turn into like a bleach white. And if you get down to Southwest Texas, they actually turn into a pink color. It's really pretty hmm. neat. Interesting. So, but this is a coach whip. Uh, and as you can tell, it kind of has a almost that ridge. You really can't see its eyes so much from the top, but it is a non-venomous coach whip. They're very long and skinny and they're really fast. Uh, you drop them off and they'll, they'll take off. If uh, at the end of this, I'll give you my YouTube link there's actually my intro there's a video of this snake going through the end of the tall grass and you can see how fast it is and i want to show you this this is a kind of a comical picture yeah. to me of that's the same this, snake uh coach whip yeah uh let me show you guys this isn't that uh, that's kind of a funny picture it makes me kind of <laughs> as far as snake pictures go yeah. you know might make me kind of chuckle a little bit and that's another reason i like them they just look prehistoric they, they look do like, uh, yes i agree like with a, that some sort of a dinosaur or a dragon mm -hmm. and uh, so you yeah. said that some of these snakes eat other snakes mm -hmm. do they eat venomous snakes they, they will they just eat any snake but they they will eat venomous snakes if, if they come across so snakes. does it would a venomous snake strike it can yeah it, a lot of times it will bite uh it will bite the, the, the snake that's eating it, but they, they're not completely immune to it. It just doesn't affect them like it would affect uh, me or you if we get bit by a venomous snake. Oh, okay. uh, the part of its body gets bit may swell up for a day or two, but really it's gonna go away. It's 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 uh, built for that. That's right, what they're built for. Right. Less, Interesting, so. okay, yeah. that was made me yeah. think about that whenever you were talking about Because they will eating. commonly bite them when they're, they'll try to grab them by the head, but that doesn't always work. Sometimes they'll, they'll still get bit. Uh, this is a, this isn't the same eastern coach whip, but these two were a pair. I found both of these under the same cover. It's got a little bit more white on its mouth. But an easy way to identify a coach whip is it's obviously it's long and skinny, but as you can see its tail, it looks like a braided end of a whip. That's why they call it a coach whip. Uh, okay. uh, the old the old tale is that they would they're so fast they would chase down their prey and they would whip it and kill it. So that's why they got the name a coach whip. And it looks like a coach whip also. But that's uh, this could be further from the truth. They don't use their tail as any sort of a defense or a aggressive weapon. Uh, that's just the way that it looks, but it does look like a braided end of a whip. And that's the way I always identify them. When I was early into snake ID, 
That was the one thing that I used that I could always tell very easily. That's an Eastern. Now here's a Western Coach Whip. As you mm. can tell, it is much wider. This was out in uh, Beckham County also. Uh, on a finding under some cover, but I put him out here on the road, took a picture of him. This guy was very, very bitey, so uh, I didn't get any real good pictures of him because I got tired of getting bit trying to get pictures of him. But uh, that's what they look like. They look a lot like the Easterns. They're just this exact same body. They're just different colors, pretty much. Uh -huh. And very different coloration. Yep. Yeah. Very Whereas different. the Easterns will be like black, almost completely black to almost a purple hue to them. These will just be pretty much jet white. I found them before where I honestly thought it was a dead snake that had been bleached in the sun and you go over there and it's alive, but it just, it's just, there can be bleach white almost. Mm. So it's pretty neat. And, uh, but that's, that's the Western coach whip. Uh, ring neck snakes. These are very, very common around here. You'll find these in the gardens under rocks all the time. Probably one of the most common ones. People, I misidentify them as a venomous snake sometime because they have bright colors on them. Everybody always thinks, well, they got bright colors, then it must be a venomous snake. Their bellies are this orangish red color. If you roll them over, uh, they'll be just bright, really pretty orange and red. And sometimes they will play dead and they will flip over also. But they have this ring around their neck. They're pretty gray. They're smooth. Their scales are real smooth. Uh, they have this ring on their neck and this really pretty orange belly. They're not going to hurt you. All they're doing is eating small invertebrates and uh, you know, worms and things like that in your garden under rocks, but they are completely harmless. This thing, it's so they're maybe might get a foot, foot and a half long at the foot long, probably at the most. Couldn't bite you if it tried, but I've handled these my whole life. Never, they're not going to bite you. They can't hurt you at all, but those are very common. People see them a, a lot. Uh, variable ground snake. These are also, it's called fossorials. They stay underneath rocks and things like that. That's kind of like the ring neck snake too, but they call them variable ground snake because they have so much variation. You cannot rely on a pattern for these guys at all. Uh, but they stay under, they're pretty much always going to be under some sort of cover. And uh, this one, uh, as you can tell, he's got, uh, you know, black marks and a red, black bars and a red stripe down his back. This one's kind of orangish with this little bit of a ring on his neck, and this one's just kind of jet orange. And most of them are just a drab brown, kind of ugly, but they're underneath rocks. They might get a foot long, same thing. They're eating small invertebrates, things like that. They're not going to go out and hurt you. So, uh, so that, that's kind of the end of the most of the non-venomous that I hit. There's a lot more, but those are the ones that are most commonly you're going to encounter in your garden uh, on a walk or something like that. Uh, we'll switch over to the uh, venomous snakes. And uh, like I said, we have seven venomous species of snakes native to Oklahoma. Every one of them can be located at some some part of southwest Oklahoma. Most of them are I'll get into the exact details, but as far as what I call Southwest Oklahoma, you, you can find all seven of them in certain areas. Uh, copperheads, these are, everybody misidentifies every, anything that has the color of copper on it is a copperhead in people's eyes, but they're not. Most of the time they're not. I'll be honest, I, of all the looking for snakes I did my whole life, I've never seen a, co a copperhead until three or four years ago, but now I know where to go find them, I'll find them all the time, but um, they're not as common as what people think. I mean, they are common, but they're not gonna show up at your doorstep every day. Uh, the easiest way to tell is it has a copper, almost like a penny color. Um, and they have, in here, here, the Eastern United States, they have kind of a Hershey kiss pattern. They're the Eastern copperheads. These are broadband copperheads that we're finding in Southwest Oklahoma that you'll find. So they don't, it's kind of a Hershey kiss, but it's more of a broad, broader band uh, hence the name, the broadband copperhead, mm -hmm. of the light to dark colored, kind of a tan to the copper colored. Uh, they will have the very pronounced canthal ridge that runs from over the eye to the nose. And you can really see it in that picture. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking from over the top of him, you can't see his eyes. Uh, he's a pit viper. You see this right here. That uh, is all Oklahoma venomous snakes are pit vipers. They use that to seek, seek the sense, the heat that comes off of its prey. So they'll sit there and they use smell with their tongue and the heat signatures that come off like a rat that'll come along and they can, they hit it, they'll bite it and uh, let it go off, it'll die and it follows it up with its sense of smell and it will eat it. So, but so they're pit vipers. Okay, so they use this as a heat, does that mean that their vision is not very their, reliable for them? Their vision or? is not great. It's not, they can't see nothing like we can, but that's just another tool that they use 
uh, to find prey because they, they primarily uh, eat things that you know are warm-blooded like mice, uh, rats, uh, rabbits, anything like that, and that just helps them helps them hunt because right. they're nocturnal. Okay. So hunting at night it really helps right. to be able to sense that heat and, and what. Do they, they get. have? Do they hear? They can. They can't hear like me and you. They more or less they they can kind of depends who you ask, but they more or less use vibrations. Like okay. when you're walking up to them, they're really sensitive to vibrations. When you're walking up, they can sense that it will get their attention. But I hearing see. stuff okay. like me and you, no, they, they can't. And do so, that. where do these things live if they're not very common? Well, they they're not common, and so they are more common in some areas, um, but they're not. It's near as common as like the rat snake. Well, everybody always thinks there's a copperhead. And it's well, a, I've a heard. I mean, I've heard people in the neighborhoods around here say we found a nest of copperheads yeah. in our flower bed. And I would Something bet you a hundred dollar like bill they didn't. Okay. Well, uh, I. In, and so that's why I'm. Yeah. I'm kind of curious. There, it's kind of weird. The range of the copperhead is broke up. It comes. You go to Eastern Stevens County, which is where we are located here. And these things are at night, certain times of year will be, I can go find nine or 10 on the road overnight. Um, wow. There's a pretty stark line that stops four or five miles east of Duncan that really not going, I'm not going to say they're not here. Mm -hmm. I've looked my whole life in Marlow and Duncan. Marlow, Duncan area, I've never found a venomous snake, never have. I don't know why, you can go 10 miles east, 10 miles west and you find them, but they're just not. Here in Duncan, I'm, actually, I'm not going to say they're not here because it's they're, they really could be, but to, they're not common at all. If they're here, I've never seen one. So they're mainly Eastern Stevens County East is where you will find them. And then it stops in around the Wichita Mountains, back up north through like Southern Caddo County in that area. There's another little batch of copperheads that's kind of sporadic, but in mm -hmm. between, really not gonna find any. Interesting. So, yeah. Uh, this is another one, this is a the biggest copperhead I've ever seen. This is, the, I told you the first night went out and decided to find a copperhead. This is the first one I ever found. And this was uh, like four foot long. That's humongous for a copperhead. Most are about two foot long. This oh, guy was wow. really big. But as you can, it's, I took this because you can kind of tell the, the pattern I was talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it's head, he has the ridge, but you see the, the copper colored bandings that, that go in there. So, uh, Western Diamondback Rattlesnake. This is the most common venomous species uh, in southwest Oklahoma. Uh, once again, uh, you're not going to find them here around Duncan or Marlow. Uh, you will find them starting about the Stevens County line east. They mm -hmm. occur in the Arbuckles and stuff. And then you will find them Wichita Mountains, north southern Cattle County, all the way west. Uh, you'll, you'll find them. And even down in Jefferson County, you know, they have the rattlesnake kind right. of stuff, but they're not, right. they are down there also, but pretty much about 81 west with a, with the variation, you'll, you'll find them. And Apache has that big. Yep, Apache has them, has them also, County, yeah. yes. Um, they kind of have a grumpy, grumpy side to them. They're just very defensive. They, this is a very typical defensive posture right here. This, I actually took this picture in South Texas, but they're the same here. But they'll take this position and they rattle their tail and they're in a striker position. They're just telling you, get away from me. I don't want trouble, just get away from me. If you come to me, you know, I will bite you. That's kind of what they're telling you. But they're very, they have a diamond back pattern, obviously, by their name. If you look over the top of them, and they have this tail that's black and white bands with the rattle. They're very easy to identify if you ever see one. They're very common in the Wichita Mountains if you like to go hike over there. Uh, in the mornings, they're commonly on the trail and stuff like that. And they're out there they're trying to thermoregulate. They're out there in the open trying to get warm. Um, this is another one. I took this one over at the Wichita Mountains, actually, or just outside it, actually, on a dirt road. But as you can see, the pattern, and they have a very common the stripe, very easy to identify stripe behind them. And they do have the diamond-shaped head, and they have the canthal ridge, as you can, canthal ridge that you can mm -hmm. see that runs right through there. Uh, timber rattlesnake. Now, these are also found, these will be found in eastern Stevens County. I found them around uh, Fuquay Lake, if people are familiar with that, uh, east. and. Uh, they're not really found west. They're they're pretty much a here east mm -hmm. species. These are a lot more kind of less temperamental most most of the time than the western diamondbacks. They just want to be left alone. Uh, they're usually not going to get in the defensive posture like that western diamondback. Never seen one do that. Now, they'll strike at you occasionally, but they just kind of want to be left alone. But easily identified because they have most of them will have this kind of an orangish kind of reddish stripe, 
and they have these chevron patterns, as I like to call them, that you, you can see. And I have another picture one a little bit I'll show you over the, uh, from the side. They have this kind of a black chevron pattern down the side, and they have a black tail with, with a rattle. So um, this one was found out in the Foster area, Eastern Stevens County. As you can see, this one's a baby. It's I'm close up with a wide angle lens. It looks big, but this thing wasn't a foot and a half long. But uh, you can see the chevron patterns that it has right through here. And uh, it's pretty, pretty easy to identify mm -hmm. uh, that way. Uh, Cottonmouth or water moccasin, this is the picture we showed earlier. Uh, as you can see, it really doesn't have the, the stripes that go from the top to the bottom. And it has the elliptical pupil. But here you can really see that Cantal ridge that I'm talking about that goes from the eyes up to the tip of the nose. It just makes looks like a shovel head almost looking from the top. Mm -hmm. That's the easiest way to, to tell them. And this is what I was talking about earlier. This is the very common defensive behavior of these guys. This was also in Eastern Stevens County. Found him on the road a few weeks ago. Uh, they will open their mouth and they'll get in this position. They'll sit there and do this. And it's trying to get your attention. Leave me alone, leave me alone, leave me alone. And he's just asking earlier if you can see the fangs. These are its fangs here, but they are covered in these sheaths here. So okay. you really can't see them. And you can see them, but that's not what you would expect to see. Right. They're not sticking out. Yeah. Cobras have fixed fangs, like cobras and certain snakes like that to where they, they, they're not near as long as these, uh -huh. but they'll stick out. They're fixed. Whereas these, they hinge out. So, but that's what they look like. But you can see the ridge. It's got the elliptical eyelid or eye there, and uh, they'll gape their mouth open. And so the fangs, uh, I haven't really asked about this, but the fangs are like hollow. Yes. Like they're more or less like hypodermic needles. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. the venom travels through them and into mm -hmm. the puncture wound yep. that they create. Yeah. They have venom glands back in here. These are this is where their venom is stored in ducts that go down through here. So when they bite you, they just squeeze they squeeze it and it injects. And it will go into you, and it's like getting injected with a hypodermic needle. Mm -hmm. So uh, in the do's and don'ts a little bit, I'll cover about old tales of what to do if you get bit by a snake that's usually pretty bad advice and uh, like trying to suck the venom out you're not going to get it out it's like trying to get in a flu shot and trying to Man, suck it out you're not going to get it out those are great movie so, scenes too yeah where people yeah do that yeah that's, true grit true, where they yeah. you know, do it, that, that doesn't work so. <laughs> but this is a very common behavior of uh of a cotton mouth they will cool up and gape their mouth if they do that likely is a cotton mouth so just make your distance let it be let it go and uh and you'll you'll be fine these are more, two more cotton mouths. Another easily identifiable feature is this black stripe that goes on their eyes. Okay, and also in this picture, these are obviously two different ones, but you can see this one almost has a round eye and this one has the elliptical eye list. That's why you really can't always use that to identify uh, a snake. So these guys were down in a creek. I pulled them up, took some pictures of them and put them back down. But you can really, really see that ridge right through there. So you reach down and pick them up? No, I say I picked them up. I don't, I don't pick, okay. pick them up. I have a hook that I hook okay. up. Okay. I right. picked up venomous uh. snakes. I, I have picked them up. Um, it's just not worth the risk. Right. Um, I'm comfortable doing it, but Murphy's Law is going to catch up with me eventually. I don't want to get bit. Do right. not want to get bit. It's, you know, you get put in the hospital, you're going to be looking at $150,000, $200,000 and a lot of pain. It's not worth it. Right. So I, when I photograph, I'm very careful uh, and I, I don't pick them up by hand ever. Prairie rattlesnake. These are not around our neck of the woods. They are primarily going to be about uh, Kiowa County, uh, Tillman County West, uh, and into North Texas. So you will find them, you know, Altus, uh, all the way up through the Oklahoma Panhandle uh, in West, and then back south into North Texas, Childress, places like that. These have more of a, they look kind of close to a Western Diamondback, but their tails will not have that they call it a coontail mm -hmm. pattern, like a mm -hmm. raccoon. They don't have that. They will have just a solid cut, like, like kind of a, the same pattern. And they have these almost a kind of a circular, some of them almost look like Pac-Man uh, okay. uh, that yeah. they have on the top of yeah. them. And they have a very, very pronounced white stripe that goes right here and here and on the front here. Mm -hmm. So that's that's going to be pretty indicative of, your, of a prairie rattlesnake. And then you're not going to find any of those around here. These are probably the most grumpy defensive snakes that you'll find. You come up on a prairie rattlesnake, it's gonna do this right here and be warning you to get away. They have a very bad disposition, so. Uh, this is another one. This one, it was a, like a yearling. I found this one in, uh, over by Mangum, I believe, years ago, but so he's got the white ridges. And uh, so you can tell by his rattle, he's really small. Mm -hmm. And also that's another thing, you can't tell how old the rattlesnake is by its rattle. 
they everybody else says one rattle equals one year. It's not true. Every time it sheds, it grains another another rattle, but they commonly break off. You can I've seen adults that are five or six foot long and have a rattle, two rattles long because it's broke off. So right. it's really not a good way to do it. But you can see its pattern. It's kind of got the little blotches, and as get older, they'll get more round and and like that. That guy there was about a foot foot and a half long. A little bitty one. Western Mossago rattlesnake. These look very similar to a prairie rattlesnake, but they're not. They are related to a pygmy rattlesnake, but they're not the same thing. People always call them a pygmy that find them in Western Oklahoma, but they're not. True pygmy rattlesnakes are found east of Duncan, whereas and east of 81, I'd say, mm -hmm. whereas these Mossago rattlesnakes are found starting about Comanche Stevens County line, very, not very, you know, they're really rare. But once you get over the Wichita's and then points west, they're a little more common. Uh, they're a smaller snake. Uh, you know, they may get two foot long. They're not gonna get much longer. Their rattle is not nearly as big and pronounced as a your typical what called crotalus that grow the western diamondback and prairie rattlesnakes that belong to. They'll be a lot smaller. They're just a lot, lot smaller. These things have some pretty potent venom, but they're so small that they don't have very big venom yield. So they're you definitely don't get bit by one. But thankfully, if they were bigger, they would be pretty bad news. But they're so small that they're they're really not that bad. This is another picture of one. Uh, as you can tell, same pattern. The, the pattern's almost the same as the prairie rattlesnake. The kind of the blotch is almost the Pac-Man shape. But there are, uh, their heads are different. The way I can tell them apart, well I can tell them apart now, but when I started is these have a nine big scales on the top of their head where the prairie rattlesnakes will have, you know, just 30 or 40 small scales. Ah. There's different scale patterns on the top for the different genus that they belong to. Interesting. So uh, this is a uh, Masagua. Western, I also call them prairie Masaguas, but Western Masagua. And there's an Eastern Masagua that's found well east of here, not in Oklahoma, but the Western will be found here in Oklahoma. This is the Western Pygmy Rattlesnake. Uh, these are found in Eastern Stevens County, Eastern Jefferson County, kind of that points east. Um, they kind of almost look like a timber rattlesnake because they've got that little orange stripe that goes down the back. Mm -hmm. And almost, the, the, if you remember, the timber rattlesnake has that chevron pattern. These just have kind of dark blotches on them. Mm -hmm. um, these will also have the nine big scales on the top because they're related to the Masaga rattlesnake in our same genus. So you have, um, that's one way to tell too if you was to want to get close enough to see the scales on their head. <laughs> yeah. But their rattle, you can't really tell, but they have a really small rattle. And you can find the biggest pygmy rattlesnake I've ever found was about a, maybe almost two foot. They just don't get very big. And they'll rattle their tail and it almost sounds like an insect. It's not going to be your typical oh, rattle that you're okay. used to hearing. It may sound like a cicada or something that's in a tree, you know, or a grasshopper or something like that. Hmm. So, but uh, these are pretty common in eastern Stevens County, eastern Jefferson County. And uh, they, they like to stay in gardens. I don't say they like to stay in gardens, but they can be in your garden and stuff. So, they're, And they're small, so that's why it's probably a good idea. If you're in an area where a copperhead or a pygmy rattlesnakes are from, if you're going to work in the garden, probably a good idea to hit at certain times of the year when it's warm out, you know, kind of go through there before you start sticking your hands down in there because you don't, you don't want to get hit by one. Right. Uh, this is another picture of it, of a, another one. It's not the same one, but as you can tell, the... Uh, the orange stripe, the blotches, and the ridge on the face, which all the venomous snakes in Oklahoma will have. And it has this stripe too, this black stripe mm -hmm. that comes under. It's kind of neat because it almost blends into the eye. They all do that. Like right. The top half of the eye, we won't go to the bottom, we'll use, it's kind of a neat camouflage that they, they have. Uh, the characteristic of venomous snakes, snakes, not steaks. I'm not talking about steaks. But, <laughs> Someone's uh, getting hungry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, venomous snake species will have the vertical cat eye pupils, but like I said, you can't always rely on that because in dark conditions they will dilate out. They're all pit vipers. All of the copperhead and the cottonmouth will have a rattle. Okay, with the exception of that being as if one of them, there are, I have seen rattlesnakes that have had an injury where the rattle's completely knocked off. It's pretty rare though. Uh, venomous snakes will have a single long scale behind the cloaca, which is their, their vent behind them. They will have a scale that's one long scale all the way down. The exception being a long nose snake, which is extremely secretive and way out in western Oklahoma. Uh, non venomous uh, snakes will have a two a double row of scales that go down behind that on their tail. So that's oh, another okay. way. Venomous snakes will have the distinctive canthal ridge. Uh, it's very pronounced in the copperheads and cottonmouths that run over the top. And that's kind of the beginners, that's what I always tell them to look for. It's the easiest defining characteristic, in, in my opinion, uh, to, to see that. Kind of an overview, this is not something that I made, this is also something I found on the internet, but 
uh, copperheads, cottonmouth, uh, masagua, western diamondback, a timber, and a prairie rattlesnake. That's kind of what they look like from the overhead view. Mm -hmm. uh, it's probably hard to see here, um, but clear. as you can tell, the copperhead or the cottonmouth, they vary a lot. When they're young, uh, they frequently get misidentified as a copperhead because they also uh, belong to the same genus. They're closely related. So they can actually look like a copperhead when they're young. When they get older, that pattern will fade and they will turn more of a black. But the, on their belly here, they'll have kind of, you see a little bit of a pattern left. Uh, myths about snakes. I keep saying snakes. Uh, snakes are the, uh, they're the most misunderstood animals, probably in general, in my opinion, and I do believe that. Uh, a great deal of what's known about them is incorrect. Uh, a few of the most common myths, and I'll go over just a few of them. Like I said, I could make a five hour show out of this, but uh, the snakes will chase you, especially, I get this all the time from uh, coach whips and cotton mouse. Cotton mouse, you know, my great granddad got chased by a cotton mouse like five miles. No, no, he didn't. Didn't happen. Um, it's false. There's, there's, there's no advantage for a snake that's like one one hundredth of your size uh, to chase you down and, and bite you. It does no good. Uh, it's just not going to happen. Uh, people who claim they've been chased are misinterpreting their behavior. Snakes are not the smartest intellectual animals, most of them. So if they perceive a threat, which is you, and they're thinking, okay, i got to get to safety. Okay? Their safe spot, if you're in between them and their safe spot, they're going to go that way. And people think, oh, it's chasing me, and they jump out of the way, it's chasing me. No, it's just trying to get to cover someplace that it feels safe. Uh, for a snake to chase you down and bite you, it doesn't want to use its venom in defense. It wants to use its venom to eat for its prey. You know, it takes a while for it to build venom back up, so it doesn't want to waste that venom. It has no, there's no reason for it to chase you down and bite you. It, it serves no purpose for the snake. It can't eat you, right. so why right. chase you down and, and bite you? That's just, mm -hmm. it's not true. A lot of that is misinterpreted uh, behavior and just, you know, old tales that's been pushed down, but it's right. really not the, true. You mentioned um, it it can't eat you. Yeah. So uh, do you talk about how snakes eat? Uh, I this? don't think I really have that in here. So, um, so snakes don't bite off mm -hmm. chunks and chew and swallow yep. pieces. Of, a lot of times when kids are here and we're talking about snakes, that's something yeah. that they might yeah, misunderstand. I, yeah, that is. They don't, yeah, they don't take bites of things. They will eat things whole. Uh, they can eat things that are, you know, twice the girth of their body. My pet snakes will feed it rats that you look at it to untrained eyes, there's no way it can eat that and it'll eat it because it will, it'll expand and, and eat it, but it eats it whole. Uh, venomous snakes will bite it and they'll back off and they'll wait for whatever it bit to die and it will go ingest whatever it is. Mm -hmm. uh, most non-venomous snakes will either constrict it or something like that. And, uh, right, and, to kill yeah, it and then... Yeah, it will eat, it, uh -huh. eat everything whole. And, yes. and like then it's muscles force the whatever yep. they've eaten down yeah. through it their body. It just pushes it all the way down it, into their stomach and then and it will digest. Okay. Yep. All right. Thanks. Yep. Uh -huh. well, another myth, uh, baby venomous snakes are more dangerous than adults. I've heard this so many times that, you know, baby snakes can't control their venom output and they will bite you and it's so much worse because their venom is a lot more potent. Anything they've done studies, baby snakes, if anything, are usually a little less potent on the venom than the adults. They, I read a study the other day, actually yesterday, that actually they've taken venom from some species of small snakes and bigger ones and as they get older they will develop a more of a toxicity to them than the babies um, the babies can control whatever venom they're going to inject just like an adult snake there's no difference uh, it, it, what will happen is if you get bit by a baby snake you're going to have a lot less venom pumped in you by you know a foot and a half long timber rattlesnake versus a five foot timber rattlesnake that's going to have four or five times the venom yield you know or a western diamondback any other snake so that's not that's not true either. Sometimes the babies are a little more spunky, you know. I think, and it's just because they're new to the world and they don't know what's going on. Mm -hmm. But as far as them uh, biting you and being worse, that's that's not true. Baby snakes aren't worse than the adults. There's no really no difference. Uh, this one, the triangular head equals venomous. This is the most common one. Everybody always, well, that's you don't know what you're talking about. That's got a triangle head. It's got to be venomous because they think, well, it's got venom sacs. So it's triangle. Well, that's not the case. Uh, posturing is a very, very big part of even human. You know, back go through history, posturing, make yourself look bigger to intimidate the enemy. Animals, humans do it all alike. Well, snakes do this also. This is that same plain bellied water snake I showed you a picture of earlier. They flatten out and they make themselves look bigger so that to try to intimidate you away. And this is what they do they flatten out, uh, and when they do that, their heads will become triangular. It doesn't mean there's venom sacs in there, but almost every snake will do this to some degree, so that's not a reliable way at all. Your venomous snakes around here will have a triangular head. 
because uh, of the venom sacs, but you're not, a, a non-venomous snake can also kind of almost look the same. You're not gonna have much of a difference there. Uh, as you can read in here, they will flatten out, look bigger. I do this in an attempt to discourage a predator, which is you at the time, they think you're a predator, from attempting to do it harm. It's not a reliable way to identify a venomous snake. Uh, only venomous snakes have elliptical pupils. This is also false, as I've been talking about. Uh, it's not a reliable way to identify snakes due to lighting conditions, produce different shapes. Uh, pupils will dilate and constrict just as ours do. As you can see, this obviously is a rattlesnake. It's a western diamondback rattlesnake. And as you can tell, because it's dark outside, its eye is dilated out, so it's round. And this is the non-venomous uh, Texas night snake that I was talking about earlier that does have the elliptical pupil, and it's completely uh, it's non-venomous, it's not going to hurt you, but like I said, it's a night snake. It goes out at night, so it uh, enhances its night vision. It has these eyes that are adapted to seeing at night more than more than round ones, so right. that's not always, always true either. Uh, this is one I always, and I've heard people that actually kind of know what they're talking about say this, and this is, can't be further from the truth. I'm no expert, but I do know this. If you get bit, you got to kill the snake so you can take it to the hospital so they can idea to know what kind of antivenom to give you. That is not true. Every species of venomous snake in North America, with the exception of a coral snake, which we do not have in Oklahoma, with the exception of a coral snake, is treated with the same antivenom. It's not, it's not uh, different from one to the other. Okay, so if you get bit by a venomous snake, leave it alone. You go over and try to kill it, you're gonna get, likely gonna get bit again, and then you've doubled your problems. So leave it alone. If you get bit by it, try to get a description of it, get to the hospital, and they can treat you symptomatically as you come up. Um, there's, it just does no good to kill it. I'm not saying that just so you don't kill it. It just does no good. It's, uh, take it with you. You're just going to get bit again, and it's going to make your problems worse. Just leave it alone. Take a picture if you can. Get out of there and get to the hospitals. Try to stay calm. Get there as quick as you can. Right. Uh, snake safety. Uh, if you're not 100% certain what the species you're looking at, then just don't touch it. It's pretty simple. Uh, if you know what it is, it's fine. But if you don't, just leave it alone. Uh, if you see a venomous snake on your property, don't try to kill it. And this is true. Statistically, a great deal of venomous snake bites come from people trying to kill it. See a venomous snake, they go over and try to kill it, and they get bitten in the process. Call somebody that knows what they're doing. Uh, I'll have some stuff up here if you live close, and I'm free. I have no problems coming out and removing any snakes that you find. I'll do that. I've done it quite a bit. Um, but when people try to kill it and they don't know what they're doing, then it's just, they, they a lot of times get bit and they end up in the hospital with a $250,000 doctor bill because they wanted to kill a snake that they weren't familiar with. It's not worth it. Just stay away from it. Uh, if it's up near your property, of what a lot of people do is spray it with a water hose. They do not like that cold water. They will remember it and they'll get away and they will not come back. So uh, just that's a good, good way to, to do that. Uh, another thing I'll cover too, if you do chop the head off of a venomous snake or cut it in two or whatever, the severed head of that snake can still bite you for hours afterwards. And, uh, they're cold-blooded, they're much different than, than humans or something like that, so if you cut their head off, there's actually videos on the internet of people trying to pick up heads they've just cut off snakes and they'll turn around latch onto them and inject venom just like they did when they're alive and it can do just as much damage. So if that does happen, leave it alone, don't touch it. Uh, if you receive a bite from a venomous snake, don't panic. Uh, just try to, it's easy to say, you know, I, I'm going to panic if I get bitten. But try to, try to stay calm, relax, get to the hospital as soon as you can and, and let them do their thing. Uh, some of the do's and don'ts, uh, like we were talking about earlier, the suction snake bite kits, they, they're, they're, you might as well throw them in the trash. They do no good. Um, it's kind of like I said, getting if you go to the hospital and get a flu shot, and then you take this and try to suck that out, it's not going to come out because it's injected into your muscle tissue. You're not you may get a you may get a something out of it, but it's not going to do any good. Uh, cutting it, you know, and sucking the sucking it out, that's not going to work. Uh, you're not going to get any of that out that way. Then also they've kind of figured out when you cut it like that, all you're doing now is you're going to cause an infection on top of your bite, so it's going to be a lot worse. The best thing you can do if you get bit. Stay calm and get to the hospital. Don't try to suck it out. Don't try to cut it. Don't apply ice. Don't apply a tourniquet. Don't do any of that stuff. Get to the hospital and they will treat it uh, the way they need to treat it. Uh, putting a tourniquet on, if you get bit on the arm, put a tourniquet, you're, you're restricting blood flow and then you've got hemotoxic venom in there and it's going to be destructive to your arm. You're going to, you're just going to do a whole lot of damage. No tourniquets or anything like that. Uh, if you want to reduce the chances of finding a snake on your property, keep your lawn mowed and reduce the clutter. That's one thing that uh, people find snakes around their house all the time. There's a lady that lived out in uh, Garvin County that found, was finding copperheads all around her house. I come out there 
Well, her grass was, you know, halfway up to my knee and she had stuff everywhere. Well, mm -hmm. it's cover for the snakes to stay in and they go to that place for food. You know, there's rats and mice coming right there, so they're just going where there's food. If you want to reduce your chances of finding a snake, keep your lawn mowed, reduce your clutter, get stuff out of there, and it's not going to be a save all, but that will definitely reduce. If you live, if you reduce the places for them to hide and live, then you reduce the chances of you finding them. Uh, this little slide here is interesting. People, one of the most, uh, you know, the fears that people have of snakes that shows that it's just really probably not worth it is, is this. Statistically, per year, six people die on average from a snake bite. And usually that's because they have some sort of a weird reaction that most people don't. Nowadays, there's no reason for you to die of a snake bite. You get to the hospital, they're going to treat you. Unless you go into anaphylactic shock, have something weird like that, nothing, you're, you're going to be fine. Uh, seven people die from spider bites. Uh, you're almost three times likely to die from Spike next door, the dog. Uh, 21 people die from dog attacks every year. Uh, hornets, bee wasps, and stuff like that, 53. Lightning strikes, 54 people. Uh, car and motorcycle accidents, as we know, 37,000. So you should be a lot more scared of the drunk going left to center and hitting you than you should be of a snake in your garden. It's just, but that's what, that's what we perceive as threats. Uh, lung cancer, 162,000 people. So. Right. Put it in perspective and realize obviously you need to respect snakes uh, this is any animal and, and you know that you don't understand or something but it's really an irrational fear it's probably the most irrational fear people have you know i'll pick up a non-venomous snake and get bit and people will lose their minds and i just laugh it's not that big of a deal it's not you know but people are very scared of them and it's because they don't understand them so that's a good statistic to kind of back that up a good internet resources for identifications. Uh, Facebook has numerous snake ID sites, a positive ID with the minutes. Almost everybody has a Facebook. Go find one of these. Educate yourself. Go uh, to these places and you can educate yourself so you're not scared. And also you'll become more confident. Even me going through some IDs, you see a lot of pictures, you'll start to learn from a lot of experts that can explain it. This wild snake education discussion, that's a national one. It's got snakes from all over the place. It's got some guys running, it's very, very smart. Uh, Oklahoma snakes, that one, I should have took that one. I think that one's been taken away. This, it's now Oklahoma Snake Identification Network, O-S-I-N, Oklahoma Snake Identification Network. That's run by some guys that are friends of mine that know way more about snakes than I will ever know. They are very, very passionate about it and they are very, very knowledgeable. You throw a picture of a snake up there in the location and within 30 seconds you're going to have a positive ID and they're going to tell you if it's venomous, non-venomous, what you need to do with it. Uh, OKSnakes.org, that's a very good website. It's ran by a guy, uh, Aaron Goodwin, I think is his name, lives up in Northeast Oklahoma. Uh, it's very, very good. I think that's who runs it. I'm sorry if I'm wrong there, but uh, it has, that's kind of what I use as a resource for when I was new to find out the ranges of snakes and uh, what to look for and things like that. It's very good. All else fails, go to my Facebook page, shoot me a picture. People do that all the time. But in spring, about twice, three times a day, I'm getting a text message or something. What kind of snake is this? I don't mind. That's kind of neat to me. Uh, send me a pic if you want, and I'll, and I'll tell you what it is. And the last slide. I know I've rambled forever. Oh, no. uh, this is my pages. Uh, Facebook, it's uh, Snakes on the Plains Photography. Instagram, it's at Snakes on the Plains. And YouTube, I just started a YouTube channel. Uh, it's Snakes on the Plains. And every one of my uh, social media platforms will have this, this picture here uh, in the back. Yeah. And this is actually a species of snake that is not native to Oklahoma. It's a blacktail rattlesnake. Uh, this picture was taken in the Franklin Mountains near El Paso. But it's an amazing it's really, photograph. Really though. pretty snake. These are some of the prettiest rattlesnakes in my opinion. That's why I have that as my uh, back, uh, my, my profile picture. So if you search it and find that, that's going to be me. I encourage you to come to my YouTube page. I just started about three or four weeks ago, but I come along on some of the adventures when I go out and look for these snakes. I've only got three or four videos, but give me some time. Uh, I was out till four in the morning filming one last night. So, uh, you know, I have more to come and it's pretty neat right along and, and see it kind of firsthand. And, um, get an inside view of it. Wow. So. Well, Nathan, thank you so much for coming on Trail Talk today. Thanks for the I don't know about you guys, but I really am, uh, I feel a lot more educated, I guess you could say, about snakes. Um, I'm, I'm still out on whether I would endear them to me yeah. <laughs> like you seem to That's do. Fine, yeah. But you do, your, your way of presenting this information is uh, very calming and reassuring. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it kind of gives me a little more confidence, I yep. think, about seeing snakes. So I hope everyone learned a lot. Go to his pages, check these things out. Um, his photography uh, is, I'm sure you were really admired a lot of the pictures, but on his Facebook page, 
uh, page. The pictures are amazing. And um, anyway, we really appreciate no you coming on Trail Talk today. Thank you for the opportunity, and uh, I hope you enjoy it. I hope you learned something. I said if you go to these, uh, my Facebook has a majority of my pictures on it, so go on there and like it. Uh, and you'll, every time I go out and take pictures, you'll get some education and also some pictures. But I do appreciate the opportunity. Thank Absolutely. you very much. Absolutely. So, guys, um, that does uh, that does it for Trail Talk today. I'm going to scoot over just a smidge so everybody can see this. Um, that does it for Trail Talk today. Uh, we uh, will be back tomorrow at 3 o'clock. We're going to learn about some of our Oklahoma State symbols. So Mary and I will be giving a little information about that. And uh, we hope you'll come back to the Chuck Wagon studio and join us tomorrow. Um, so tomorrow's at 3 o'clock, but starting next week, we're switching to 2 o'clock. All of our trail talks will be at 2 o'clock. Don't start at 2 Well, go ahead at 2 o'clock tomorrow if you want to and just chill because we won't be on until 3. <laughs> but next week, we'll be starting at 2. So everybody turn your microphones on and mute yourself so you can sign off with us. We always sign off uh, by saying happy trails together. Okay. <laughs> so whenever if everybody's ready, okay. One, two, three, happy, happy trails. trails.